let's do a little bit of expectation setting for the, the audience here because this is a fun and super interesting topic. However, I do want to be clear, like you are not here to talk about uh, stuff that hasn't yet been planned or announced. You're definitely not going to talk about uh, politics or uh, a fiscal policy or, or specific questions about specific companies. You're really here to talk about central bank digital currency models, some of the advantages or disadvantages and wh why people are pursuing this and, and private sector models. And so I just want to, to, to lay out that expectation. So if you're expecting Bob Bench to, to go on a, a long discussion about why we were printing money or not printing money, I'm afraid that we won't be able to do. Uh, so Bob, with that, you know, before I, I dive into some of the pre-prepared questions I have for you, uh, and by the way, I love the fact that you're standing by your fireplace for our fireside chat. If, I wish you would have, if you could have lit it, that would have been even more amazing. But thank you, welcome, and, and tell us a little bit about your amazing background, because I, I think when I learned about this, I thought you are the person for this discussion. Yeah, well, again, thank you for the introduction, uh, and thank you for putting this on. This is a fantastic forum. Uh, for uh, for this time, and it's it's very timely to be talking about this item. Um, <clears throat> I, can, I do want to start off with my disclosure that uh, my words today do not represent uh, an opinion of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the Federal Reserve System, or the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Uh, these are my opinions alone, and, I, and I'm excited to share them with you uh, and everyone online. Uh, we have uh, we were, we're in a really interesting time, and, and I'm, I found myself here, um, like a lot of folks have found their way into this space. Uh, not necessarily in a clear, clean and straight path. Uh, I started my career at the U.S. Treasury Department uh, examining banks uh, post 9-11 uh, in New York City uh, and then found my way to law school and helped banks uh, at a large firm like EY uh, meet laws and regulations post-crisis, post-2009 crisis. Um, following that career in bank regulation, I, I moved into uh, Circle, uh, one of the first large uh, blockchain companies in the U.S., uh, and helped lead Circle from a regulatory perspective and work with the team at Circle to launch multiple blockchain-based products, um, including U.S. Dollar Coin, uh, which we launched through the Center Consortium uh, along with Coinbase. Uh, following that work, you know, I think I saw that there was a lot of potential here. Uh, and the leadership at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston uh, had been doing vanguard work among central banks early on, and I got to know them well, and, and they invited me to join, and I saw a really great opportunity to work with uh, what is you know, the deepest bench in the world when it comes to economic thinking, uh, financial policy, uh, bank regulation uh, at the Federal Reserve. And so I've been at the Federal Reserve a year now, focusing exclusively on blockchain, uh, crypto, uh, and the application of these technologies, not only to the mission of the Federal Reserve, but how the emergence of these technologies could cause an externality to our mission. Uh, we need to see ourselves as a, as a partner uh, in the world economic community, and, and there are externalities that we need to think about and be prepared for. Uh, and so I'm excited to talk about that uh, and uh, hear what the folks on the panel have to say. Terrific. So, so I would love, the thing I would really love for you to start with is, and you've been studying this even longer than we have, uh, there are so many different ideas, proposals, concepts that have been circulated around the world with regard to how central banks can or should implement their digital currencies. Give us a bit of a level set on the different models you're seeing and some of the pros and cons that you think are, are emerging for those different models. Sure. Uh, so my team and I at the Fed have been thinking about this a lot. And, and what, one thing we're really seeing, and we always try to level set when we have these conversations, is there is no one size fits all uh, for central bank models. Uh, what you really see is each central bank determining whether they have a problem they need to solve and whether that problem can be solved by these emerging technologies. Uh, and, and then also understanding their own economy and, and where these technologies can be applied to their own economy. So the first way we look at this, um, and this is certainly not mutually exclusive, but probably the simplest way to look at it, is are you applying this technology for wholesale purposes or general purposes? Um, so are you trying to build a wholesale central bank digital currency which is almost exclusively used for institutional partners. Um, so permission institutions moving cash back and forth effectively. Uh, and that really narrows the scape of what risks you're looking at and how you build that underlying technology. Therein you're mostly building a, transaction, a transactional technology. Uh, just things like data collection may not be as important. But then the other side of that model is um, general purpose digital currencies, which are for 
um, the, which is a new form of central bank liability that can be made available to institutions, say banks, uh, non-banks, uh, retail, retail customers, and retail businesses. Uh, and depending on how you build it, intermediaries may or may not be necessary um, and may or may not be mutually exclusive. So that's the first buckets we look at. The second type of bucket, uh, which is what the BIS classified, is are you dealing in an account-based model or a token-based model? Now, this isn't new to digital currencies. Uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of, uh, Bank of Japan recently had a speech on this. And the way he spoke to it was, there's always been token-based models, right? Cash is a token-based model. The instrument itself transfers the value. Um, since we've had a ledger system, so since at least uh, Italy in the, with the Medici's, there's been an account-based system, which is a ledger in which you communicate through an intermediary in a ledger and value is transferred on that ledger itself. So that's how we look at it. But the great thing about technology is there's so many ways to apply these models uh, based on the needs of that individual country. Do you uh, see, like, among the different models, where do you see, like, the return on investment? Like, if, if you were thinking about it from the lens of, okay, what's the value that we can create? Sometimes the value is a literal value. We can make the economy more efficient. We can have a better understanding. Some of the value might be we can have a better understanding of risk. Where so far do you see kind of the big buckets, keeping with our bucket theme, where are the big buckets of value that central banks are seeing in this? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, what we like to look, to look at again is what is the use case for that country? And so when we talk with other central banks, their use cases can differ dramatically. Uh, I'll start with one end of the spectrum, which is the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which is one of the closest central banks in the world to actually launching a digital currency. Um, they've been working closely with a U.S.-based company, and their main goal was uh, to make moving money faster than it currently is. And so currently in the Eastern Caribbean, it's a collection of several dozen countries. Uh, in order to move cash, you have to put it on a boat or a plane uh, and move it from island to island. And that's a use case that doesn't apply to Poland, right? Poland's not a collection of islands. And so the Eastern Caribbean, it costs you $100 flat fee to move any cash. So at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, their model is it has to be faster than a boat or a plane, and it has to be cheaper than $100. And so that's what they have to solve for. And so there's a great ROI for a country that has significant economic hardship to be able to move money between families in the Caribbean for cheaper than $100 and faster than a boat. Um, on the flip side, you have some market-based economies such as Singapore and Switzerland who have very robust capital market programs. And like a lot of uh, capital market countries and capital market economies, uh, the cash settlement system is on completely different rails than the security system. And so one thing we've seen from our central bank counterparts who have done research in this area is that there is significant potential return on investment, uh, reducing settlement times between the securities markets and the cash markets. Uh, Switzerland has gone as far as experimenting on a single rail for both cash settlement and security settlement, which is really, really interesting. Uh, certain markets in the U.S. take months to settle uh, from a cash perspective. And so people a lot smarter than me at the Federal Reserve are looking at to what kind of efficiencies can be gained there. So those are some of the ROIs that are really interesting. But again, you always come back to what is the problem that central bank is trying to solve based upon their country's economic needs. And it can go differ between moving money faster than a boat or trying to radically change global capital markets. So I think you'd have a lot of volunteers for moving money around the Eastern Caribbean uh, for less than $100. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe not as fast within the boat, but at the same speed for a lower price. I think you might be flooded with volunteers. One thing I was going to ask you about, I, you didn't mention it, but a, a, a statement I heard from a number of central bankers was actually around competition. I heard, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to disclose the, the countries that I talked to, but one of the things that I heard uh, several times was that whether it's in credit cards or kind of mobile payments, there are a number of countries where the, the level of competition in those markets is very small. And central banks think that the introduction of a proper digital currency could lead to a significant increase in the banks, entities, and institutions that can easily manage digital money transfers and would kick up the level of payments competition to a whole new level. Yeah, we, we've seen that as well. Um, you know, certainly the People's Bank of China has discussed the need for a competition amongst their two heavyweights, Alipay and WeChat. You know, they, they really um, got into mobile payments by leapfrogging um, into the 
21st century. And they've been very public that they, they see systemic risk in those two rails and, and they need to add a third leg to that stool. And so that's one area where they need competition, not necessarily for pricing, but for systemic risk itself. Um, other countries such as Sweden have had robust payment, uh, digital payment systems in place. Cash is going away there. And so they're creating a central bank digital currency to add a state-based competitor to the payment systems because cash is going away. And one critical need for any currency is that it's universally accessible by people. And if all persons can't access your nation's currency, whether it's digitally or physical, um, that's a big problem for central banks. And so you're really seeing the need for a government option. Now, whether that government option works through banks, works through banks and fintechs, or works directly with the central bank, there is a feeling of a need for a, a, a central bank or government option. Uh, so perfect answers. You know, you, you, you kind of touched on some of the key case examples that we've also spoken to in that need for, for competition and the value of competition. Um, talk to me a little bit about kind of the role of programmability in central bank digital currencies. If, if, I, if you think about systemic risk, if I know where the cash is, that's one piece of it. But in reality, uh, if I have some cash, but I've also entered into a digital contract for a very risky security, there's a order of 10, 100, 1,000 times more risk in the, the, the digital security contract than there might be in the cash. So, so t tell us a little bit about the programmability thoughts that, that exist in different countries with regard to central bank digital currencies. And th this is a great uh, topic for people who are deep in this space about the pros and cons of programmability. Um, I'm a big fan of the Nikki Lauda statement of ad lightness, um, which effectively says that, you know, when you add more things to something, it gets more complex uh, and it can sometimes get less efficient. Um, programmability adds a lot of interesting options to a payment system uh, if you're dealing with multitudes of assets um, for, for depending on the contracts you're trying to use. However, when you add programmability, one thing we're also hearing from central bankers and academics is you also add a lot of surface area, right? Or a, or a tax surface, if you will. And so, you know, one thing that when we look at the recurring themes from central banks, the overwhelming theme we hear is security is number one. Uh, to put the full faith and trust of a government vis-a-vis -vis their currency into a digital object, uh, that needs to be as unhackable as possible. And every extra layer of code you add on to that instrument is a widening of the attack surface. And so what we're seeing from central bankers is every bit of even programmability or even data capture is analyzed against how wide does this make my attack surface and how much more does this make my currency a, a, a target for hackers? Um, because safety has to be everything. And then once you move to safety, you get to what we think is the second phase or what we talk to other central bankers, which is speed. Um, you, your digital currency needs to, going back to the boat example of the Eastern Caribbean, right? Their digital currency needs to be faster than a boat. Uh, if you're in Sweden, your e-krona needs to be faster than the other payment option. And so the second level requirement we're routinely hearing is this has to be just as fast as what we just left from or what we're leaving from or the problem we're trying to solve. And so if you can get programmability after the security question, and then after the throughput question, then you can get really interesting. Um, we've seen research on this uh, regarding, uh, as 5G networks tend to increase, the best example of this is at the Amazon stores, right? You walk in and out of an Amazon store without any kind of particular transaction, it reads your mobile device and a payment is processed. Um, as 5G continues, as server speeds continue, transaction speeds may actually get a whole lot faster. Uh, you may actually transact a lot more without a device, without any kind of, uh, with maybe even biometrics. And so what does that mean for speed and what does that mean for programmability? So that's really interesting. I, I think what you're getting at, and I think folks that like to think about more of the trans, you know, you have the Bitcoin camp and Ethereum camp, the Bitcoin camp focused on transaction speed, the Ethereum camp program focuses on the Turing complete capabilities of Ethereum. Um, if you start combining assets and thinking about doing transactions asset to asset, such as you know, commodity trading or derivative trading, for example, that can get really interesting. But again, you have to look at the first order effects of how wide does this make my, make my attack surface and how, how much does this slow me down? Because if you can't meet the highest levels of cybersecurity, 
and you can't need, you can't move as fast as at least the most recent technology. I think programmability is a nice to have and a not must do, um, but it's really interesting. So actually, this is a this is a very interesting segue, right? So if you think about stable coins that are out there, right, dollar backed stable coins, uh, when we go into a world of uh, central bank digital currency. Um, will there really need, be a need for traditional stable coins? And if some of the value of traditional stable coins goes away, is the value of stable coins now moving from its, its dollar backs to its programmable? And is there some way that you can use stable coins that are out there that are not issued by a central bank as a mechanism for dipping your toe in the water or testing out programmability without doing too much too quickly at once? You know, I think, um... You know, I've had wonderful experience all along the stablecoin spectrum. You know, I was at Circle uh, leading the regulatory efforts during the boom. And so we saw, we, got the, we saw Tether very closely um, and the challenges they had on the Omni network. So settlement was fairly slow on Omni and that's why they moved to Ethereum. Um, then we had the, I had the you know, pleasure of building a USDC with the teams from Circle and Coinbase along the center consortium. And so we saw a lot of possibilities there. Um, but for the most part, the stablecoin world remains a tool to escape volatility in crypto assets on exchanges and in the OTC space. Um, and it really hasn't left that yet. But you have learned a lot um, about, you know, you know, every Tether transaction, every USDC transaction is an experiment that researchers can look into and learn why are traders migrating to one stablecoin or the other. Um, you know, currently most stable coins this day are digital representations of commercial paper, right? So most of these stable coins have agreements with a large bank or several large banks that hold reserves and they are tokenized representative of those reserves. Um, some are more transparent than others. We certainly tried our best at USDC to get there as, as close as possible. Um, now that being said, what, what role will these central bank digital currencies play to compete with the stable coins? depends on the use case of that central bank. So, you know, in, in, if you have a highly permissioned model that only banking institutions can offer either wallets or accounts on a central bank digital currency, well then it might not, you might not have banking access to the current crypto exchanges. So nothing might change for the stable coin space. Um, if you have a more permissionless model in some countries, then you could see a wider adoption. But again, you're always balancing those policy perspectives of, of where are we allowing that money to go? Do we know who's using that money? Um, will we know our customer? Will we be following the FATF guidelines? Um, and that's going to be a consistent balancing act. And I think stablecoin providers um, you know, make best efforts to meet those standards. But at the same time, the, the financial institutions certainly have not jumped full in and created their own stablecoins, for example. So, uh, uh, and speaking of that, what do you think it's going to take, or do you expect to see at some point financial institutions being comfortable to jump into the water of creating stable coins? Uh, do they do they think you'll think they'll wait till there's a real central bank digital currency, or do you think they might sort of start to proceed soon? Well, you've seen public statements by two large U.S. banking organizations. Uh, certainly, uh, J.P. Morgan has done significant research and has dedicated a lot of time and money and and, and uh, headspace to building the quorum platform uh, off Ethereum. And then uh, Wells Fargo has announced their project with R3 uh, based on Corda. Again, these primarily remain um, from their public documents, uh, wholesale mechanisms. And, and, and I think there's a lot to be gained there uh, for certain clients. Um, but I think, again, you have to, it, they have to be looking to solve a problem, right? These are fun thinking exercises. And you know, for the engineers we work with and the engineers I worked with in my prior career, it's really fun work to do. But, you know, some countries have spent almost a decade on this and have ended up in traditional data architectures and have remained not using blockchain because of concerns of speed and security. So again, you have to make sure that for the, for the nail you're trying to hit, are you using a hammer or are you trying, you know, the, the example I always use is, I can hammer a nail with my iPhone. I may get two nails in, but my iPhone's gonna be broke at the end. Um, if, but sometimes you just need a hammer. And you don't need Turing completeness to hammer a nail. Um, and so I think every central bank needs to understand the use case and every commercial bank needs to understand the use case and needs to understand whether this type of data architecture and or this type of data architecture plus Turing complete computing is necessary for transactional activity. 
um, and, and can they either cost justify it or find a problem they need to solve? And I think, I think folks are still asking those questions and talking to great researchers, talking to central banks, talking to firms like E&Y to get a better understanding of, is this useful for me or is this solving a problem for me? And I think a lot of institutions are still asking that question. So you've talked a lot about balancing acts. I think probably one of the number one balancing acts that's gonna come up is around privacy, right? What is, uh, particularly in countries that, that have a strong value of privacy, what kind of case examples or thinking are you seeing about how to balance transparency and efficiency and regulatory compliance with uh, a user or individual or entity privacy? Yeah, and, 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 you're, and you put the nail right in the head there, uh, Paul. Every country has their own cultural, legal, regulatory view on privacy. Um, and it runs a full spectrum. You know, I think the U.S. is somewhere in the middle. Um, what we've seen is multitudes of models from, from one end, you know, countries who just do not believe that privacy, that any person has any right to privacy, they're leveraging data collection to, to perform multiple use cases, to better manage the economy through fiscal policy, to better manage the currency through monetary policy, to really understand national security concerns. Um, so that's you know, one side of the spectrum. And, and, and then the other side, we've seen um, countries really struggling to get even past go because of the cultural value that having a privacy bearer instrument exists. In the US, we have a bit of a balanced system whereby financial institutions are subject to the Bank Secrecy Act and the regulations promulgated therein, whereby they have to meet certain rules about knowing your customer. But those data points are tightly defined. Right, you, you're very defined on what you're allowed to collect. Um, on the flip side, and I, and I think a really important uh, counterweight to put is is how the internet was built, and, and, and what you know what Mark Andreessen calls the, in, the original sin of the internet, right? Which is that the bulk of internet revenue models are still remain based upon data collection, data sale, right? So it's a collection of data, the sorting of data, and the selling of that data to advertisers. That remains the core revenue model of the internet. Um, and so how, do, where do we find that balance where we, you know, we're here on Zoom, Zoom is collecting some of our data right now as we speak, um, and Zoom will, Zoom will certainly monetize that data in some way. Um, and so, but as, and so are we okay in the stablecoin side, providing that, that one remaining data gap, which is payments, right? So if the whole original hole in the internet was, payment data couldn't be collected because you know, Andreessen couldn't get, a, couldn't get Visa and MasterCard all to agree on how to collect data from payments. And so if we go to a private sector stablecoin environment, we have to understand that a lot more data is being collected about us, um, like some countries do on the government side. So you know, to your original question, what are we seeing? We're seeing some countries say, all right, this is a bearer instrument and thus we are giving you account limits. So you can have up, of up to say $1,000 US or $5,000 US, and these are US equivalents, if you will, um, of effectively bearer transactions. And anything over that- So truly, truly like digital cash, real privacy, in other words. You are seeing that model being proposed. Other models you're seeing is you have account limits, right? So you can only have, call it 10,000 US in your account, a lot like the current CTR limits, um, and the, uh, the SARS limits where if you have, if you move, take, take $3,000 in cash out of your bank, anything that I'm up, you get transaction reports happening to you. Or in SARS, if you move a block of $10,000, you'll have a, a, a transaction report sent to FinCEN. So you're seeing models based on that of up to a certain limit, you're private, but anything above that, you're not. Um, and I think uh, policymakers are thinking hard about this because I think any, you know, you know, what we're seeing in the US is a lot of folks are saying, we're gonna really apply strict scrutiny to this. Um, any bit of data you're collecting, if this is supposed to be something like cash, certainly not a cash replacement, but something like cash, we really wanna understand why you're collecting this data. What is the necessary use for it? Who's collecting it, right? Is, is the banks, are the banks collecting it through their account structures or their wallet structures? Is the Federal Reserve collecting it? Cause that's really new and unique to us. Is someone like FinCEN collecting it? And FinCEN's been doing this for a while now and they have a system in place and a well-structured legal and regulatory environment to do it. What you're really looking at is people being very thoughtful on this data question because it has to be done very carefully with very strict scrutiny. Uh, and that's just the policy side. 
On the technology side, again, I go back to the add lightness question and add simplicity question. It's always harder to add simplicity than to add complexity. Any more data you collect makes this system a little less efficient, right? And, and that, that's the beauty of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is transaction data only, which is really, which makes Bitcoin pretty hard to break. Um, and so as we look at what data we have, we not only have to think from the policy perspective, but how much inefficiency does they add to the network? How much slower does it make it? How much less secure does it make it? And then at the end of the day, if it's not decentralized, what is that, you know, what kind of bounty is there for someone trying to break into it? And so we have to be extremely careful with any data collection. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the harder questions for any country approaching this is what do we collect and why are we collecting it? Because people take their privacy very seriously and rightfully so. So obviously privacy is one of the big headwinds kind of figuring that out. Other than privacy, what do you see as the biggest headwinds in terms of, of slowing down the adoption of this uh, technology platform or this capability, I should say? Sure. Um, you know, I think we've, the internet and, and, and the internet culture has been around long enough and I certainly saw this in my time in the space, is there is such a large appetite for failure. And that has what made the Silicon Valley's culture so strong and so great, is they have failed fast, learned from failure, and, and, and hopefully they learn at fairly low stakes, right? And so, and they learn at low stakes and they, and they kind of up their stakes and they get better at it. Uh, so a, a, a brand new startup can fail multiple times as long as you learn from that failure, you can continue to gain VC money, right? If they think you're on the right path. We're not starting from low stakes here. Every country in the world who's thinking about this is starting from the utmost highest stakes, which is the value that represents the full faith and credit of their country. And then for the overwhelming majority of their citizens, the reserve of their labor, right? You're, for the overwhelming majority of citizens, cash is the entirety of their labor value. And so we, have to, we are dealing with the highest of stakes. And so move fast and break things won't work here. And so we have to understand all the risks on the table. Um, and that's, that's just part one. And then part two is uh, we are unique in the United States in that we have a fantastic history of public-private partnerships and innovation. Uh, the internet itself was a public initiative that worked with universities and later the tech sector to build what has become the most transformative internet technology of the last you know, century, if you will. And so with that in mind, we still need to understand how are we going to build this partnership the right way? And, and I think we will, we're gonna, gonna keep learning. Um, and the most important thing from our perspective, now that I'm back on the public side, is how do we keep learning from not only the private sector folks who have been building internet technology have been working on specifically blockchain for a while. But you have a very deep bench here at the Federal Reserve of women and men who have been working in capital markets and payment systems for multitudes of decades. And so if you're talking with someone, you're talking with a woman at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York who has been there for 35 years, and she's been at the forefront of multitudes of technology changes and payments on capital markets, her hair won't necessarily blow back when you tell her blockchain because she's been there before and she has a lot to teach you. And I think that's the best conversations we're having now are those women and men who have been in the Federal Reserve System managing these payment architectures and understanding these risks for decades now are working with the Silicon Valley folks who are, who are understanding how to really innovate and how to drive change and, and, and how to learn quickly. And I think that's one thing we're learning a lot from each other is is you have private sector firms working on this technology, offering financial products, you know, stable coins, for example, um, and then interacting with highly experienced people in the, in the public side to learn where do we take that highest stakes game that we're looking at and, and, and how do we see a path forward, if at all. But again, it comes back to, is there a problem we need to solve or are current methods good and are current methods working for us? And I, that's kind of the core question we have to come back. We come back to, and every country has to come back to, is what problem are we looking to solve? And does this tool solve that problem? This is, you, you very much remind me of something that we talk a lot about at EY, which is this phrase that we use, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the challenge that, that exists is, you know, yes, you can do cool stuff with new technologies, but if it doesn't solve an existing problem, the chances of it being adopted are low simply because of the level of risk associated with ripping and replacing systems. 
Um, uh, I'm going to ask you one more question before I go to audience questions, which is, what is the role of uh, blockchains like the public Ethereum blockchain in, uh, in kind of laying the foundation for interacting with central bank digital currencies? No, I think, you know, you know, I won't speak to any specific public blockchain. Um, you know, I think what you are getting with the central, central bank digital currency questions is, you know, you have great firms you know, that are actively monitoring the performance of these public blockchains, right? Um, and so what you can start doing is understanding what does throughput look like at massive scale? Uh, what does security look like at massive scale? What does governance look like at massive scale? And what we're now seeing, and, and people who think about these questions on the public side, is you now have you know one use case, which is Bitcoin, which has been around for you know almost we're ne we're nearing on 12 years, right? Um, talking about October 2009, and Ethereum has been around for about eight, um, you know almost nine years, uh, nine, 14, right? So seven years almost. Um, and so you have two great use cases of what, what does transaction speed look like? What does security look like? How are, how, are, when you're building financial products on top of those, like some innovators have, what, what has worked? What hasn't worked? And, and you're at least getting a laboratory there uh, to say, you know, is this any better than building something centralized on traditional data architectures? And I think you have a lot of great academics, a lot of great public servants asking those questions and testing that. That's why you're seeing so much experimentation happening in the system right now. Um, you know, Singapore has done great work. Canada has done great work. Sweden's done work. Switzerland. I mean, we're nearing over, over a dozen, almost two dozen countries now who have something in play to be ready to understand, are these, is this technology available to solve my problems? Whether those problems are cross-border transactions, whether those problems are financial inclusion, whether those problems are efficient capital markets, they're testing it. And I think that's, that's really important stuff is understanding where these technologies can be applied. And I think the other really important thing is communities, communities have been developed for software engineering, software architecture, cybersecurity, whereby you have tens of thousands of people around the world with their hands in this dirt, trying to make this better, trying to find flaws. And I think that's a big, big gain to these open source systems is it enables a lot of people to attack them and to make them better. And I think that that gets, people like me really excited because it lets us know if, if there's a problem to be solved, we know these bugs have been knocked out, right? And I think a lot of central bankers are excited at those, those blockchains that have been around a while uh, that have been hacked at and, and, and worked on by thousands and thousands of people. So can I, before I, I hand over uh, to, to some audience questions, I just wanna comment and say how much it warms my heart to hear you talk about the value of public attacks, of, of these kinds of things, right? The, the transparency that you get with the attacks that take place in Ethereum and Bitcoin and other public blockchains, uh, it's often used by companies selling private blockchains as a way of creating fear and uncertainty because those things are public. And to, to hear kind of somebody from the Federal Reserve really demonstrate that you guys understand that the transparency is a security benefit not a drawback uh, really uh, uh, makes me smile. So I, I think it's, it's uh, to me, it's a foundational part of the reason why public blockchains are so incredibly important. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, we have been collecting questions. Uh, uh, we've been collecting them on Reddit. We've been collecting them on the YouTube live feed and we've been collecting them here in Zoom. And my colleague, Eli Wolfson, has actually been um, uh, collating those and Eli is gonna uh, come on the line and he's gonna read as a disembodied voice out some of those questions for you from the audience. Elon? Yes, I will. So the first question from the audience is, how dependent are central banks on the private sector to make CBDCs accessible and usable? So I think current experimentation has almost exclusively been with private sector participants. Uh, certainly, uh, but I think that's changing. I think central banks are learning that uh, what, I, what, I, what I call the leverage effect of having a great engineering and data science teams. And so currently they are learning great amounts from the existing private sector firms uh, and have built great partnerships, whether it's um, Singapore's Project Ubin has done this, Canada's Project Jasper has done this, um, just to name a few. Uh, but like any, you know, I think again, the value is public and private partnerships and where we can learn from each other, it's critical. Uh, and I think you have a real, a consensus among the private sector and the public sector that there's a lot 
of good that can come from this technology that can benefit a lot of people. And they're all excited to work together. That's good. Uh, the next question is, uh, since today we're speaking about current use cases for the digital currency, are any central banks that you're aware of explicitly exploring this for preventing monitoring illicit activity? So the question there is, are, are we, ha have I heard of any or researched any central bank models for the purpose of what you're effectively asking is, will this help AMF? And I think mm -hmm. without question, if you create a digital currency, um, that most, I don't say most, but I think a lot of countries will use that to their advantage to better understand where financial crime is occurring. Uh, I think again, to our earlier conversation, every bit of data you collect in a, at least a general purpose digital currency model needs to undergo strict scrutiny to understand what's the public use case. But that will depend country by country. Some countries who have very strong and robust national security environments, who do not have strong cultural beliefs and privacy, may take a lot of, take a lot of information from your payment system and it'd be warmly welcomed by the population. Do you have any rough timelines specifically for a federal bank on a use case uh, which may replace, fix some existing problem that could go to production? No, I, I, use one, I used two examples earlier today. Uh, so one, Sweden has made, made it clear that cash use has gone down significantly and they wanna provide a digital currency that is universal. Uh, they do not want their citizens to be subject to private sector monopolies on currency on, on digital payments. And so that was a problem they identified and they're attacking it uh, with the eCorona project. Similarly, like I said earlier, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank had a terrible problem of it being extremely costly to move money island to island. And so they partnered with a US technology firm to deliver a solution that enables uh, transaction speeds that are fairly fast and enables highly secure payments uh, leveraging, leveraging uh, crypto technology. And so you have two cases where countries looked at their own economy, their own problems, and solved it using the tool. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of that based upon each country's individual problems. So I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm the uh, host of this event and sneak in one of my own questions for you, which is what kind of macroeconomic effect are you thinking we might see, right? Obviously, velocity of money, right? If we had more insight into the economy or more insight into the velocity of money, how might that change the potential for faster economic growth or a better ability to provision credit? Uh, as we go into this, uh, we saw this in 2008, right? The Fed pumped a ton of liquidity into the system, but the speed of that money slowed down significantly, right? Uh, what kinds of macroeconomic effects do you think we might see from more widely deploying a, a digital current, a central bank digital currency versus just a current version of electronic money we have? Uh, well, well, I'll answer this very carefully. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve has the deepest bench of PhD economists in the world. As a non-PhD economist, uh, I hesitate to put one toe into their water. Um, but I've learned a lot from them and from other economists around the world, and they've said some of this publicly. You know, certainly cross-border payments are very, very expensive. And certain countries depend heavily on remittances. There's a big play there for certain local economies on, on the micro side, you know, that, that rely heavily on remittances that could get great efficiencies. Um, certainly there is an appetite for some persons that want direct payments from the government as opposed to going through a bank. Um, that, and that, that's something that I think some people are interested in, but I'm not well versed in the economic models that would say whether that's good or bad. Um, you're also seeing uh, persons look at the return of investment on cash markets and, cap and securities markets. Um, again, that's not my area of expertise, but that's certainly been stated in certain papers um, to be very, to have a very high ROI. Um, but again, and then there's also the question of dollarization. If dollars are in high demand, and you can only get them physically, you're limited by physics and how fast you can move them. Um, there's costs and certainly benefits. Well, let's say the benefits and certainly costs to dollarization and that other Federal Reserve uh, economists have researched heavily, but certainly times like now when the dollar is in extreme high demand, being, being able to move dollar, dollars digitally very fast has a major impact on certain micro, micro economies and macro economies. Terrific, uh, Eli, I hand it back to you for additional questions. Sure. Uh, do you think governments can benefit in increases in efficiency of coordinating government processes 
among different branches by using the public Ethereum chain and programmability? Again, I, I don't want to speak about any, you know, any specific chain. I, I think a lot of chains have their own costs and benefits. Um, and I think, uh, so I don't really understand the question necessarily. Was it in between governments or government, like within, within a government or across governments? Uh, within different, uh, across different branches of government. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't see the problem being solved there, but I just, I haven't, I haven't researched that, so I don't know. Okay. I'm gonna uh, bring us towards a conclusion. We've got, uh, I think, time for sort of one last thought here. So, Bob, what I would really love is if you would sort of sum up or, or give us your thoughts about um, how quickly we will see uh, uh, some action around the world and how long you think it will take central bankers to kind of absorb those lessons and start acting on them. I think, again, this is gonna go back to how these problems emerge and, and how central banks get a lot smarter on how this technology can solve those problems. I think you will have announcements by several major economies that they are going forward. Um, and I think that should be happening within the year. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal has reported that that might, uh, on that yesterday. Uh, I think what you're going to see again is the application of this technology, the better understanding of this technology to existing problems. Um, and as people become more digitalized, I think that problem is going to emerge more. I think Sweden is going to happen in more places of people using more and more digital currencies or digital payments and people desiring to use digital payments in other ways and understanding whether or not this technology solves it better than the private sector. Um, and I think that's, that's the real question for a lot of folks is, is government stepping in here, providing a digital currency, going to provide a better solution than the private sector? And I think in most cases, that remains an open question, but it's important that the public sector continue to understand what questions to ask and continue to look for those problems in case we need to be prepared to move. Fantastic. Uh, I want to thank you, Bob, for joining us today, for giving us your insight. This has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, thank you so much, and, and we really appreciate your time and the insights that you brought to our discussion. So uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Well, we are now coming to the end of day three and we are day two, excuse me, and we are not quite finished with day two. We are about to go into kind of a little bit of our, our final wrap up here. And uh, what I'm going to ask uh, uh, my colleagues to do, my guest stars, uh, we've got Luke Kerner, Megan Nab, and now we have Jeremiah Nichol, JT Nichol from the Ethereum Finance Forum. And so what I would like to do is really kind of in a closing round, ask uh, Lou and then Megan to share us their kind of closing thoughts on the day. Uh, and then we'll finish up with uh, JT after them. I've got a couple extra questions for JT because it's her, his first time uh, joining us today. So uh, Lou, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in order from left to right on my screen and I'll start with you, please. Sure, so I thought it was a, a great day, Paul. Great job by uh, Ian Y getting some great speakers. Um, the, the whole day really worked flawlessly. Uh, and it was a super interesting discussion to, to, to end on. Um, you know, with, with just with regards to the, the, the last panel, I was uh, surprised by, uh, you know, it, it seemed his, I guess, lack of enthusiasm for the programmability of money, the fact that, you know, they were really solving more for security and speed and programmability would, would slow that down. Uh, and also, you know, what he didn't talk about was the degree we're getting into, you know, digitized currency. You know, I think there's the, the, there's the possibility or the hope that there will be a lot more competition between the different currencies. And I think programmability of your currency and innovation uh, uh, in your currency, uh, you know, if, if it works anything like Silicon Valley, you know, that's going to, I think, you know, be, you know, super important for which currencies people want to hold to the degree they have the option of holding different currencies. Very good. And, and Lou, can I just thank you again for taking the time to be with us and share your insights today. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Dying to hear, you're still on mute, by the way, but dying to hear your closing thoughts as soon as you unmute yourself. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to get to be a part of this event. Uh, you know, my perspective is, especially listening to uh, you know, Bob's takes on some of the things that we were just talking about an hour ago makes me really optimistic to be an entrepreneur in this environment, right? That, uh, you know, the people like leading these uh, initiatives at the government level uh, have an open mind, are, you know, are interested in seeing what, uh, what the private sector can come up with. And I really appreciate the approach of, 
um, you know, optimizing for what, you know, what central banks need to be solely focused on, right, which is, um, you know, security and speed. Uh, so it's very encouraging to me. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to following up on day three and all the good stuff that you guys have going, um, you know, and continue the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Megan, for joining us. And now, JT, if you'll, you'll, you'll put your video back on, I want to say first, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, the Ethereum Finance Forum, not just for this event, but for more than the last couple of years, has been the place where we go to hear thoughtful questions and analysis. I think more than any other group, when we put out a statement or we, we, we lay out our product vision, we get great questions. And I think what we have learned over the last couple of years is that great questions and great engagement come from terrific moderation. So before I go any further, JT, first of all, thank you. Secondly, um, would you just tell us a little bit about the Ethereum Finance Forum on Reddit and, uh, uh, and, and then share a couple of thoughts about the day that we've had so far? Okay, so the, the ETH Finance uh, Reddit was born in August of last year. It was uh, born out of ETH Trader when several of us moderators uh, left to start a kind of a new way of, of doing Reddit. And since that time, I mean, we, we've got a pretty good approach on trying to, uh, we, we've developed like a monthly developers thread where we're, we invite teams, large and small, anybody to come in and they can put their URL, their information, their LinkedIn, their Discord, all their information. Because what we found back in the ICO days is that we were trying to pick and choose which projects were legit and which ones weren't. And that was utterly impossible. And so we figured out if we build a little bit of a sandbox and use the community's input to kind of help us take out the scams, then I think we can bring some visibility to smaller teams out there and, uh, you know, get the conversations going. And, you know, the, the pandemic in this situation here has, we figured out a way to do a long form conversation and help uh, bring summits to life on ETH Finance. And I, you know, moving forward, I hope that we can be a custodian for some of the uh, content that other summits may, may have. We, I feel, very good about the positive energy from the community members there. We've got, we've got everybody in that place. Everybody from accountants, lawyers, all the way down to the unemployed, to people that work in, in just general labor jobs. And we need all those people. And that is kind of your community of investors. And there's also this guiding light of helping people find the right places to get code if they want to try to develop. And then we're, we're doing a handshake with our ETH staker where I'm a mod there where we're gonna help people learn about staking. And it may be to not, not just teach them about staking uh, at their house, but also staking as a service and teaching about all the different options that are out there with 2.0 coming down the pike. Yeah, JT, I mean, I, one thing I, I really like is, you know, at Ernst & Young, we have passed the, we're, we are not a scam test on ETH Finance, so I, I'm very happy that we <laughs> passed that benchmark. <laughs> Yeah, you made it. You've, you've arrived, Paul. You made it on Reddit, isn't that? Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. If, no, I remember finding you in the comments, uh, I think it was after the Nightfall announcement or so, maybe 18 months ago. And since then, we, you know, this is the first time that you and I have had a chance to video uh, chat with each other. And, and uh, it's just, it's been awesome to, you know, finally get to meet you and, and all these panelists, you know, normally I don't come on a video conference after a person from the Federal Reserve is, you know, <laughs> in the previous segment. So it's neat, but the, just to go back to the community again, I mean, the youth finance community is, a, it's, it's wonderful. And they cross pollinate into other areas too. They, they're all cross pollinating into other um, avenues of investment and, uh, you know, technology. So it's, it's really neat to, uh, try to use Reddit in a way it hasn't been done before with this. Yes, indeed. I agree. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, JT. And uh, uh, John, I'll ask you to put up our closing uh, slide presentation, our closing thank you slides. I, I mentioned this at the beginning. I want to hit it out again. The team at EY that has put this stuff together over the last uh, uh, really 30 days under incredible time pressure has done a, an astounding job. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, Stefano Alessandri this morning, uh, uh, Namil Dalal, Amy Lowe, Jared Shaw, Nathan McCauley, Raquel Garva, Vincent Anunzio, Bob Bench, and Joao Reginato, greatly appreciated. 
I want to express my gratitude again today to the EY, my fellow EY partners and presenters, uh, Giuseppe Peroni in Italy, Anna Gosine, Jeffrey Davis, David Middleton, Paul McIntosh, Todd Smith, Dennis Post, Frank Putman, and John Robotham. I, I said it yesterday, I will repeat it again today. I am so proud of how EY is operating. Um, I know everywhere around the world things are a little bit different, but here in the US, our leadership committed no layoffs during this time. Uh, we also committed that we will, uh, we had some layoffs that were in progress and we stopped them because we did not want anybody going out into this job market and we will honor every single one of our job offers. And, and that is, those are the kinds of decisions that I would like to make, even though as partners, we're all gonna take a hit here. It's the right one and I'm, I'm just really, I feel proud to be part of a group of people who have made the right choice around this. Um, I wanna thank the team that has done this Merikit, Lindsay, Kalen, and Barbara, uh, as well as Eli and John Bahir, Suraj, uh, who have done so much. And of course, one more thank you to JT Nicole and the Ethereum Finance Forum. We will be back tomorrow with a deep dive into privacy and technology on blockchain. And until then, I hope you all have a terrific evening and, and thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye.